Um, okay, so I'm going to do a quick session here. Um, I don't uh, have anybody uh, here at the moment. So this will just be kind of some announcements and things and just to let you know kind of what's going on and just to let you know that you can, you know, uh, 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 contact me if you have questions, ask about things or stuff. So looks like DTLL is, is actually down at the moment here. So, um, so yeah, this is our final week. Um, I, I returned back to problem set five. I thought I'd, I'd spend a few minutes talking about um, some of the issues on that because I think it might help uh, with the test two here. So um, I still got the test two scheduled, uh, sorry, the test, the test five, the final unit uh, five test scheduled for this, uh, the end of this week, kind of at the usual time. So it would normally be open on Thursday and would be due by Friday. I can have some flexibility on that because, you know, we still do have another week after that for finals. So uh, let me know. But uh, but that's the the, the dates on, on the, the test right now. So so, yeah, today and, and Thursday, you know, both of them might be quick sessions. I thought I, I would review a little bit of the test and review the problem set five here. So. Um, So I, I did have a few things to, to kind of uh, mention about the problem set five, uh, especially about the third question, which might help uh, on the test. The, there'll probably be a similar question to the third question um, on our test five here. So um, for one thing, um, a lot of people, you, it, it would really be better if you give like a, the if, uh, individual time steps of equal length, right? So a lot of people like, um, for this first one, did something like zero to 20 and then 20 to 40 and then 40 to 80, right? So, so have unequal and just use the labels to indicate the length of time, which is fine, except some people missed a point because they have the label wrong or something like that, right? So it'd be more likely to get it completely right if you um, divide it, your schedule into equal time steps um and and give the process um, that's running for each uh time step that you have okay um besides that most people had the the first three cor mostly correct um um i think maybe only one or two were doing something wrong um got, got something messed up uh, especially on part b i think was the only one where a few people missed that one so. So I won't talk about that, but uh, in any more detail, but, you know, don't skip over this when you're reviewing because you will get some more questions, um, you know, and, and you, know, you might get some other policies. So make certain you can do things that we didn't do yet um, on the problem set, you know, highest response ratio next, um, um, shortest process next, which is simpler than shortest remaining time, but um, um, maybe a feedback scheduler. So we, we kind of did uh, a straightforward priority, but, but you know, might be asked to do kind of with the feedback scheduler with multiple uh, uh, Q levels that uh, capture how long a process has been running, that type of thing. So, so make sure you can do those things. So. Um, also for problem two, oh, I was gonna, um, I was gonna post, um, I mean, so obviously some people, even though this is supposed to be a fourth year, um, you know, kind of senior level um, uh, course, um, haven't done stuff with series and sequences and stuff. I, I tend to, to assume that people at least know what that is, even if you haven't taken a course in discrete mathematics, uh, which is where you would most likely run into it formally, right? So, so you know, when you have a, a, a um, here, we, we were defining a series in order to define the exponential um, um, average, how to calculate it, right? Um, conceptually, it's pretty simple. I mean, you, you know, you take, it's, it's really a weighted average. You take uh, whatever alpha is. So, so like if one alpha is, is 0.8, you take uh, uh, 0.8 or 80% of the most recent value and combine that with 20% of the average that you had up to that point, right? And that's really all it is. This exponential average is, is a weighted average of the most recent value and the average of all the values up to that point, the, the weighted average. Right? So, so I, I did take off one point uh, because um, some people had asked about this and I, and I gave what you need to do, but to, for, to calculate the, the first time step for the weighted average, um, um, you really 
from the problem, um, the, the initial guess was, uh, was 10. You're supposed to use that um, for when you're calculating the, uh, the, the um, what was it? The, um, uh, the estimate at time two. So the estimate at time two is gonna be a weighted average of the estimate at time one, but you don't have an estimate at time one. So the initial guess was supposed to be 10. Uh, plus, yeah, so you weight that. So, you, so like, you know, for the alpha is 0.8, you take 0.8 of 10 plus um, uh, 0.2 of the, the, the value at time six, right? So for um, an alpha of 0.8, that ends up being closer to six than 10, right? It should be 80% of the way, it should only be 20% 20, 20 of the way between six and 10, right? That's that's four steps. So, so twenty five percent of that would be would be um, would be four. So so it's less than than um, uh, than that. Um, but and you know so you can see it's easier to calculate in your head point five because point five should be halfway between six and ten. So you get um, point eight there, right? Um, and then for the simple average, I mean, you know, you really don't have an estimate at time one, or maybe the more correct estimate, because uh, the, the, the initial guess, you can think of that as kind of the first estimate, but you wouldn't use that for the simple average. The simple average is just going to be the average of all the values uh, in the previous time step. So it should be six for the first one. And then for time step three, your estimate is going to be the average of time one plus time two. So six plus four divided by two or, or five. So that's what I was looking for here. If, if you didn't use the initial first time guess, I took one point off for that. But uh, the, the more um, troubling problem, again, um, you know, so I could tell um, some people were unfamiliar with calculating sequences and series uh, like we had from the notation here. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, fully a third maybe not quite that many, but, but a lot of people were getting values for the exponential averages that were greater than uh, the, the, the values that you seen before, okay? But, you know, so these are averages. So, so, so people that were getting values above 12, you know, 14, 20, whatever, um, anywhere, in here, any value above 12. Um, I mean, what, you're, you're not doing it correctly, but more importantly, you, you're not understanding the fundamental thing that's going on here, right? So, so it, it's tough to catch mistakes if you don't really understand what you're doing and what's going on here, right? So, so, so these averages, whether simple or this exponential weighted average is being used in order to estimate, make a prediction of what the next burst time might be using the previous history. So, so the burst time that you predict should always be in the range of the values you've seen before. It shouldn't be bigger or smaller. You know, it might be equal, right? So, so, you know, here we're almost equal to the, the last three burst times that we've seen because an exponential weighted average more quickly, you know, this is, this is trying to illustrate um, that, that these weighted averages are more responsive, right? So if we had three burst times of 13 in a row, we much more quickly for, for the weighted uh, alpha 0.8 begin to predict close to around 13. But you'd never predict 20 if, if the highest you've seen so far is 13. You've always seen values less than that, um, you know, uh, no greater than 13, right? So that's, that's kind of nonsensical, and, and it's just an indication that, that you know, people really aren't understanding what they're doing here, or what the purpose of this was, or didn't read the textbook, you know, close to so, so that. You got more points off for that if, if, um, if you were making mistakes where you were giving nonsensical um, averages, weighted averages, or, or simple averages. Um, and finally, um, so I want to talk, so a lot of people weren't doing three right, even though we discussed this multiple times, okay? So, I mean, at a minimum, if I ask you to do multiprocessor scheduling where you have two CPUs, you have to have two CPUs and show the schedule of the processes running on the two CPUs, okay? So lots of people were only doing single CPU scheduling and, and got you know, a third or more of the points taken off for that. And I should have taken off almost all the points probably. So I probably took off like eight, maybe half or a little less than half for that. All right, so, you know, um, 
you could very well see another question to do multiprocessor scheduling on test five. So, so make sure you understand this, right? So here, um, um, I, I talked about this in the class before. I mean, there's kind of two extremes when you have multiple CPUs. This is talked about in chapter 10. You should make sure that you read chapter 10. You know, there will be questions on it um, on our final uh, unit five test here. So, um, so the two extremes though, are either to have one common queue and then all the CPUs scheduled from the common queue. That's what you were supposed to do on this problem or for each CPU to have its own private queue. So then once you um, assign a new process onto a particular CPU, it would always stay and always run on that CPU if, if you use um, private queues for your CPU, right? And then you can have strategies that are in between where, where a process tries to stay on the CPU it's assigned to, but periodically the operating system might pick some processes and move them to a different CPU if, if one of the CPUs becomes underutilized, okay? So, you know, make certain you can do this problem for, for the test um, so, and, and including the other ex extremes, you know, so I might ask you to do a multi-CPU schedule, but um, where you, where when a process comes on into the system, uh, it's assigned to a private queue for the CPU and then for thereafter it would stay on that CPU. So that kind of a, of, of a problem, the, the, the main issue is usually when the new process arrives, selecting which CPU to assign it to, right? So, so a typical uh, strategy that the operating system does for that would be you look at the number of processes or even better, like, like in this case, you look at the remaining time, the total service time um, or the total remaining time for all the processes that are currently assigned to all the CPUs. And you select the CPUs that has the smallest remaining time or service time of processes already assigned to it, right? Um, so in that, that could, but again, you know, you'd, for, for that extreme, you'd be making the decision only when the process arrives of which CPU to assign it to, which queue to put it on. All right. So for this process, though, we have a common queue. Okay. So when process A arrives, um, uh, and we're using a time quantum of three here. So when process A arrives, it's going to be scheduled to run from time zero to three oops, here, right? Um, now, during that time, there's no other process in the system. So there's nothing for CPU two to, to do for time zero to one, time one to two. So it's going to be idle. But at, at time two, process B arrives. Okay, so immediately when process B arrives, since, since CPU2 is idle at time two, it would get scheduled for a, a three time slice quantum, all right? So to so get scheduled to run from two to five, right? In the meantime, then, um, these are supposed to, to help remind me when the process, processes are arriving here, right? So in the meantime, um, A only has a service time of four, so it, it, it gets scheduled for another three time slice quantums, but it, uh, finishes at time four, right? And then again, at time four, B is running on CPU two um, and um, um, A is finished and C doesn't, hasn't arrived yet. So CPU one would be idle for, from time four to five, okay? And immediately when, when C arrives at time five, it would get scheduled for three time slice quantum, right? Um, and then B arrives at time six, but at this point, both B and C haven't, um, their, their time slices haven't expired. So D would actually be on the common ready queue at this point here, right? Um, which is why, so, so the, the, the first process to, to finish here, um, uh, by, by, our, uh, by the rules above, this is where there's the first possible ambiguity. Okay, so we've got um, process C and B, um, timing out here. Actually, process B is finished, okay? So only process C times out. D is already on the ready queue, so it should definitely be scheduled first, whichever CPU um, uh, hits the, um, the, the ready queue first, right? Um, and then, but, but E is arriving um, and C is timing out, okay? So by the rules above here, we should put E on the ready queue first. So the ready queue before we schedule for time eight has D, followed by E, followed by C, right? So, so the timing out process should be put um, last on the ready queue, the after arriving processes, right? And then by the other rule, uh, since both CPU and C, 
one and CPU two become idle at this time step, uh, we, we start by dispatching, you know, scheduling CPU one. So it gets D, which was at the front of the queue, um, and then CPU two gets E, which is which was second on the queue. Right? And we still got C now on, on the, the, ready, the common ready queue here. So D would run for three time slices. E um, only has a system time of two. So it finishes at time 10. And then um, at that point, you know, uh, CPU one is still running. The CPU two is idle. So, and C is, is on the queue. And, and also um, F is on the queue now at this point as well. Right? But we would schedule C to run. It would finish off. Um, and then when CPU one finishes, it would schedule F. Some people had, had too many Fs for some reason. I, I didn't figure that out, but but you got a, a two points or so off for that, right? So you know another, another thing about these schedules, you know, another check to make certain you understand what's going on. Um, I mean, you should see that that the total number of runs. This is another reason why you want to have uh, your time steps be of equal size, but I, because I can count these up, yeah. I can see to check that I'm correct. You know, so F had a service time of three, so it should only run three times, which it did. E had a service time of two. So if I look through all of the scheduled, I should see two running for two service times. D had a total of four. So there was a one, two, three of it, and it's fourth one there, right? Um, um, C had a total service time of five. So it got scheduled for first three there, uh, and then it's last two for a total of five there, and so on, right? B had six, and A should only have four, right? So that's a good check to make, you know, whether you're doing multi CPU scheduling or single CPU scheduling, you, know, you could go back and look at your schedule. If you have these all equal size time steps, um, you can count those up and compare those to your service time or your burst time in this case. So uh, 60 millisecond burst time should come down to six uh, 10 millisecond um, time slices on a schedule like this, just as an example. All right, anyway, so that's the schedule I had there. Hopefully that's correct. Um, you know, review that, make certain you can do that for the test. So you very well could see a multi-CPU schedule. Make certain you can do it, you know, for variations. You know, so I might not give you the same one. So it's a, a multi-CPU scheduler with a common ready queue. It might give it to you on the other extreme where every CPU has its own private um, queue, right? With rules on on how you decide when a new process arrives, which queue to assign it to, or CPU to assign it to. All right. Um, yep, yeah, so I thought that, that, that's a problem I'm gonna say about the assignment five. If you have questions about that, let me know. Looks like uh, D2L is still down here, which shouldn't affect us for this class. So the, the test isn't open up till Thursday anyway. So, um, oh, did I mention I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't returned back the fifth program assignments. Um, so I was going to see if people had questions on those. I, I mean, you know, you still have a chance to submit those, but I, I have done most all the ones that I've received. So I'll be, I will be returning those soon. So, you know, if you were still working on the assignment five, you can send me a, some last minute questions, but you should try and wrap it up and submit whatever work you have for the program assignment five. Um, I, I will be returning those in a bit. So. Um, all right. So for you guys, if, if you've finished your program assignment and your problem set, um, um, all we've got is the, the final unit test five, right? We're not gonna have a comprehensive exam for this class. Um, So, you know, some things that you ought to understand when you're reviewing for this test, reading through chapter nine, 10. Um, so we're kind of what are the three levels that our textbook talks about scheduling? So there was the long-term, medium-term, and short-term. And which one is the, the kind of scheduling that we talk about, right? Do, do you know that, right? So, so, so really the, 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 the scheduling algorithms that, that we talked about, shortest process next and first come first serve and um, round robin are examples of the shortest term scheduling, right? So typically the CPU is making decisions many times a second um, and deciding which process to schedule next at each one of those times. You know. 
So long-term scheduling is really about usually, you can think of that as uh, not so much scheduling, maybe as admitting or not new processes into the system, right? Long-term scheduling isn't very typically done on general purpose computer uh, operating systems um, like you have, like your laptop or a typical server or something. It's more of a, and in fact, it's a little bit more of a dated thing. So, so, so for like batching systems and stuff, the, 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 the long-term scheduler might be more um, needed um, so to keep the number of processes currently um, being managed by the system to some particular level. Right? And then medium-term scheduling, um, um, the, the textbook kind of uh, talks about that that's really equivalent to the uh, uh, swapping decision, right? So, so we've talked a little bit about swapping, um, you know, so, so, or suspending a process. So, so, so if, if the operating system becomes overloaded, we might decide to kick out a process or, or some processes, kick it out of main memory to free up main memory and to free up any resources that it might've been allocated uh, to that process. So, uh, you know, free up um, uh, memory, um, stack space, uh, uh, free up entries in the process table, stuff like that, which can help the, the uh, operating system have more resources available for the other remaining processes, right? So usually that, that swapping decision is run at a more medium term than, than the short-term scheduler. Um, and we might decide to suspend some processes if things are overloaded. Um, make sure you can define turnaround time, service time, and the ratio, okay, and understand why it's useful, right? So usually if we're comparing two uh, schedulers, um, we don't look at the raw uh, turnaround time, which is how long it took from when the process was newly created or newly arrived to when it finished, right? That's the turnaround time. Um, so just because um, a scheduler uh, has smaller turnaround times than another scheduler doesn't necessarily mean that that scheduler is is better, right? It's really kind of the, the ratio of, of how long um, a process takes to complete it to how long the process is in total. So it's total service time, right? So we talked a little bit about that in the lecture videos this week and stuff in our textbook, uh, why the, the ratio is normally the better thing to use when you're comparing um, processes, you know, when, when you're comparing uh, process scheduling algorithms. Um, preemptive versus non-preemptive policies is a major distinction. Make sure you understand the difference. Again, most real um, um, general purpose operating systems have to use preemptive scheduling policies. Uh, so if, if you use a non-preemptive scheduling policy on your laptop, that would, that would imply that when you start running a program, um, it wouldn't give up, um, you know, it wouldn't be allowed to be preempted so you could, you could switch to another process, right? That would have implications like if, you, if you're trying to run uh, applications on your laptop, right? You, so you really have to, to run uh, things on general purpose operating systems using some sort of preemption. So usually time slice, um, round robin, um, queuing with usually a, some sort of priority based uh, mechanism. Um, but, you know, so again, non preemptive or more useful for like batching systems, maybe or, or older systems. Um, um, make sure you understand the decision functions for all these process schedules that we talked about. Um, just kind of understand, um, you know, so some scheduling policies are better for short processes, which you can equate to uh, processes that are I.O. bound. So, so another way to think of short processes or think of these as processes that have short burst times. So a short burst time implies that I only execute for a bit of time before I have to do some I.O. And wait for the disk, right? Whereas long processes, um, you can think of those as being compute bound. So they compute, they, they, they run for a long time before they have to do some IO, right? Um, so some scheduling policies do better for a compute bound or long processes, and some scheduling policies um, are preferential to short processes or um, IO bound processes, right? Usually you kind of want to have the balance. You, you don't want to have 
you don't want to have a scheduling policy um, that um, 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 penalizes one too much at the expense of other types of processes. Um, you ought to be able to understand kind of the, the idea between um, synchronization granularity, so fine to coarse grain synchronization. So that's an issue for multiple process scheduling. Um, so, and, and understand these kinds of different load sharing. So in particular, you know, I, I was just talking about this. So when you have multiple CPUs, there's kind of two extremes and, and then load balancing or load sharing uh, are what modern operating system typically do. So, so, so the, we, we usually don't use one extreme or the other. We, we normally want to try to assign processes and, and try to keep them on the CPU as long as we can, on the one that they originally start with, um, as long as we can. But um, after a while, if we've been running and if there's nothing left, you know, if the CPU becomes underutilized, we want to make, and this would happen in kind of like a medium term scheduler. Um, so this is another thing that you might do on medium term scheduling. So you might want to do some load balancing, right? So some CPU has no processes or has a lot fewer processes than others. You might want to move some processes. So, so, so change their CPU affiliation from one CPU uh, to a different one to, to kind of balance that load. Um, so make certain you can do the, the, the uh, all the different process scheduling algorithms, short, short term schedulers. Um, for a single CPU, make certain you can do that if we have two, two or, or more CPUs um, and so on. All right. All right, so yeah, I think that's all, you know, that I wanted to mention on this. Um, I don't know if um, 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 I'll talk any, uh, on, on our next Thursday, last Thursday session, so that'll be kind of optional. I'll, I'll be on Zoom uh, in case anybody has questions about things, um, but, um, um, otherwise, um, I might not do any more review or anything for the final unit test five. So, so yeah, uh, get your final programs in. Um, get uh, you know, um, um, and uh, think about the problem set five. Review, use that to review for the, the final test five. So, um, some people have been asking about past assignments that haven't been graded yet. So, you know, I've, uh, the, my policy always is, is if it was late or incorrect, you really should resubmit or, or submit it, uh, even though it was late. Um, I will look at those, right? How much credit and, 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 and um, um, what I do looking at those depends a lot on your history of work, right? So uh, a person that had just one slip up, missed one assignment and corrected it relatively quickly. So, so you, know, you, you, um, um, you missed it for whatever reason, you submitted it just uh, the next day as soon as you realized you'd missed it or had, had submitted it to the wrong submission folder or something like that. Um, so, so, you know, so, so, so if it wasn't a repeated pattern of being late or missing work or, or repeatedly submitting code that couldn't be compiled, right? So if you did that multiple times, I'll be less inclined to um, give credit, you know, if you weren't learning from your mistakes, right? But if you only did it once and you didn't get an assignment graded because I couldn't, um, graded initially you know so i might go back and, and just regrade that um so, right. so there's that so so hopefully you know if you only had one thing or two things that you missed or did wrong um i probably will look at it the other thing though is that um it, it is also based on um um your point so i, I usually push this off till final grading uh because uh you know if you already have an a I, I probably won't look at it, you know, even if you've missed some stuff um, or if you're close to an A, I mean, you normally do have to, to um, earn an A from the, the, the work that you did, right? So being late, so the, if, again, if it was just one and, and those point, points for that one late assignment might push you over, then, then yeah, I might look at it, especially if, if you're really close, right? Um, but if you had multiple things um, and you were close to that eighth threshold, not so much, right? Especially if, if, if you were more than a few points away. Uh, but uh, on, on the flip side of that, you know, it, I definitely will look at all past stuff for people that um, are below like three C thresholds to see um, you know, 
why they didn't have those assignments in, why they were late, that type of stuff, right? And see if I can give some points. You know, so I do want you know uh, uh, anybody that can um, to get above that threshold. And the same kind of goes for B, uh, the uh, the difference between the C and the B threshold, um, um, although maybe a little bit less so than, than for C. I, I tend to go look at the people that are below Cs first, um, uh, look at any late or um, um, uh, bad or time that didn't compile, didn't get grades, that type of thing. Look at that first. And then go back and look at the, at the Bs. And again, you know, if you're really close to the B threshold, and it's only one thing that's that's a different situation than if you're a couple of points away and you had multiple um, instances where you were late or missed something you know, or, or, or didn't submit something that, that could be graded uh, correctly. All right. So anyway, that, that's the general policy. Um, uh, and I will be looking at those next week. So next week, since it's finals week, uh, we, we, you know, we don't have a cumulative final for this class, uh, but um, I will be available during normal office hours if you need to discuss final grades or anything like that. So, um, all right. So that's it for this uh, lecture video. Um, I'll post this as usual. As usual, keep sending me your questions and things, and I will see you guys later.